Welcome to Lore Evolution. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so for the uninitiated, this is the show where we take a look at the production history of our favourite factions, characters and technologies from the realm of sci-fi and fantasy. And seeing as how the heavily Romulan-centric Star Trek Picard recently wrapped up, I thought it appropriate to take a gander at the Federation's oldest foe. The Romulans and their empire were first introduced in the Star Trek The Original Series episode Balance of Terror. Although Jean L. Kuhn often received credit for the creation of the Romulans for many years, writer Paul Schneider was the actual creator. He was famously inspired by the World War II thriller Enemy Below, in creating the battle of wits between two starship captains. According to Schneider, it was his son's own obsession with the Romulan Empire which inspired him to create the Romulans. Schneider saw the Romulans as a race which had formed a Roman-like empire empire on their own world which simply never died, and continued to advance well into space travel. With the limited resources of the original series, it was also Schneider who conceived of the Romulans and Vulcans having a shared ancestry, although the exact relationship between the two races was often retconned later down the line. What made the Romulans so appealing to many writers of the show was their inherent sense of mystery. Their origins and their culture were shrouded in secrecy, and left a lot of potential for future scripts. The Klingons, on the other hand, who became the de facto bad guys of the show, wore much of their culture and identity on their sleeves. The Romulans were also presented with a strikingly different kind of characterization than the Klingons. John Colicos was delightfully memorable as the fiendish and merciless Kang, however Mark Leonard's portrayal of the Romulan commander was much more sympathetic. The Romulans in Balance of Terror are not irredeemable evildoers, but equals to the Enterprise with their own sense of honour and strong bonds between crew members. It's thanks to the excellent writing and terrific guest performance that the first appearance of the Romulans comes in one of the best episodes of the original series. Although, as stated, while the Klingons would go on to become the main antagonistic faction for Kirk's era, the Romulans have many connections to their Imperial rivals. For one thing, their starships are a little bit confusing, historically speaking. Take the iconic Klingon D7 battlecruiser, for instance, a fantastic piece of design which perfectly nails that warrior-like presence of the Klingons. Surprising then that it was also primarily used by the Romulans. The practical reason for this being the show simply couldn't afford to build a brand new model for a Romulan battlecruiser. However, some confusion also also surrounded the Bird of Prey designated ships. In the original script outline for Star Trek III The Search for Spock, Harve Bennett intended to use the Romulans as the primary villains of the story. However, in subsequent meetings, it was Leonard Nimoy who suggested changing them to Klingon antagonists. This is why Search for Spock introduces the Klingon Bird of Prey. Up until that point, the D7 battlecruiser had become THE iconic Klingon ship, whereas the Romulan Bird of Prey was the iconic Romulan ship. And so in Harve Bennett's original outline, the Romulan antagonists would use their signature ship. When this was changed to Klingons, however, it seems there was a simple swap of Romulan to Klingon, resulting in the new Klingon Bird of Prey as we see in Search for Spock. As with the D7, the term Bird of Prey in Star Trek is much more associated with the Klingons than the Romulans. The Romulans would make some more minor appearances in other Star Trek movies, such as The Final Frontier and The Undiscovered Country. However, by that point, they had already made their return in... For Star Trek's first major spin-off, the Romulans made their return in the season 1 finale The Neutral Zone. This appearance was intended to be part of a three-episode arc, written by then showrunner Maurice Hurley, which would see the Federation and Romulan Empire uniting to fight the emerging threat from the Borg. While this arc never came to fruition, that didn't stop the Romulans from making plenty more appearances. A notable change was the overall look of the Romulans. In order to make them more distinct from Vulcans, makeup artist Michael Westmore included a forehead appliance which gave the Romulans a permanent frown. Together with their abrasive looking costumes and awesome looking Romulan warbird ships, the Romulan Empire seemed more powerful and threatening than ever before. However, the Romulans still maintained their sense of secrecy. While the Cold War with the Klingons often took the form of posturing and threats, the Romulans were portrayed as more cunning and politically savvy. Although Gene Roddenberry initially mandated a policy of the Romulans not being used in a villainous capacity, through their subsequent appearances, they actually became the primary antagonist of the next generation, being featured in that show more than any other Star Trek series. And I'm honestly glad they did. The clashes between the Federation and the Romulan Empire often produced some fantastic episodes throughout the next generation. The Enemy, The Defector, Unification Parts 1 and 2, and Face of the Enemy are personal favourites of mine. And once again that sense of nuance is preserved. Whereas glorious battle and conquest is a celebrated element within Klingon society, 
It's made clear the Romulan Empire is an oppressive and tyrannical regime. The Tal Shiar secret police keeping the population in check, and a steady stream of nationalistic propaganda convincing them of their inherent superiority to other factions. Because of this, we get to sympathise with many one-off Romulan characters. Previously, I've confessed my less than enthusiastic response to TNG's Klingon-centric episodes, but the Romulan-centric stories, in my opinion at least, are of a more consistently high quality. Once again, the Romulans were slated as the antagonists for another Trek movie, and then dropped. Originally, they were meant to be the villains in Star Trek Insurrection before the Sona were introduced instead, however, Star Trek Nemesis gave us an even deeper look into the Empire. Through Shinzon, we learn of the Remans, created by writer John Logan, a slave race residing on a twin planet within the Romulans' home system. Once again, maintaining the Roman influence, naming the worlds after the brothers featured in the Roman Empire's creation myth. While Shinzon and the Riemann's plan would spell death and destruction for many, their origins continue to keep that sympathetic element. Enterprise was in a tricky position when it came to the Romulans. As it's established in Balance of Terror, humans didn't even know what a Romulan looked like until the 23rd century. And despite the attempts of the production team, Enterprise does chalk up a number of continuity issues. For example, in Balance of Terror, cloaking technology and even remote viewing screens are relatively recent inventions, with cloaking only being introduced in that same episode. However, in Enterprise, the crew witnesses an early Romulan bird of prey decloaking, as well as a number of other cloak-capable ships. And of course, the view screen technology is all over the place. Balance of Terror also referred to the Earth-Romulan War as being primarily fought with atomic weapons, but Enterprise already has photon torpedoes and phasers. Also, the Romulans use holograms, even though that's supposed to be a new thing in TNG, although there is sort of a holodeck in the animated show, and yeah! Unfortunately, what was likely to be the most interesting Romulan story in Enterprise never saw the light of day. Season 5 was meant to portray the Earth-Romulan War in full, and further seasons would see the founding of the Federation itself. But unfortunately, the show was cancelled, which is a shame because Enterprise had finally gotten good with its latter two seasons. The recently concluded first season of Star Trek Picard followed in the footsteps of TNG by having a heavy Romulan focus. And in general, Picard's depiction of Romulans pretty much plays to all their strengths. We get a nicely intriguing Romulan conspiracy plot, there are a number of sympathetic Romulan characters, the Romulans show off some badass new ships, but Picard also builds on these strengths by giving us an even deeper look into Romulan culture. The Romulans in general are in a fascinating place at this point in the Star Trek timeline. Their empire is fractured, their homeworld is gone, they aren't the united superpower faction they once were, and as a result many elements which would have been shielded behind state secrecy are now free to be explored. In terms of design, Picard features both the Romulans of the original series and the forehead ridge design from TNG, making the Romulan race more diverse in general. We also see that the Romulans actually retained a lot of their Vulcan heritage. The Romulans, it turns out, have numerous spiritual traditions and methods of mental discipline. As a people, they aren't just all scheming spies and subcommanders. However, as I said earlier, their exact origin isn't quite as clear as one may think. In Balance of Terror, Spock speculates that Vulcans and Romulans evolved separately from the same ancestor. However, later incarnations of the Romulans suggest the Romulans themselves are an offshoot from Vulcans. In a novel, The Romulan Way by Diane Duane, it was first contact by hostile Orion raiders, which prompts the split. The mythical figure Surak promotes pacifism and logic, while a radical named Satask favours strength. When these two opposing forces threaten to fall into civil war, Satask leads his followers on a migration, where they later settle and invent a new language, culture, and society, becoming not the Romulans, but the Rihansu. The name Romulan is merely the English name created by Federation explorers. The same goes for the Remans and the names of their respective homeworlds. However, in the Vulcan Soul trilogy by Josepha Sherman and Susan Schwartz, the origin story is a little different. In this trilogy, the Vulcan homeworld was being consumed by wars, and Surak oversaw an exodus of people to ensure their race survived in case their homeworld was ever fully destroyed. And it was this group of exiles who later became the Romulans. I personally find both stories quite fascinating. Perhaps the former is the myth told within Romulan society, and the latter is the truth of what happened. I think that could be quite cool. The Romulans are a truly interesting part of the Star Trek universe. While the Klingons are more popular, the Romulans are often more nuanced. 
Even from their very first appearance, they've been portrayed as worthy foes of the Federation with real dimensionality. They've made terrific villains, but also tragic victims. They've been a big part of Trek's most recent installment, and I'm keen to see what new territory they're taken into. 5067 Alexander Camp asks, Would you rather the next Star Trek movie take place in the Kelvin timeline or the Prime timeline? I personally hope to see more from the Kelvin timeline. I think it's a great cast and the classic characters they play have been given really good material in those films. Into Darkness did squander a lot of potential, but Beyond in my opinion really nailed what I think a Star Trek movie should be. I would be really disappointed if they started from scratch again with the movies. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, feel free to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. Over on my Patreon, you can see videos early. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.